Hey, good morning. Um, my name is uh, Tim Osby. This is my wife, Diana. Um, we're kind of newcomers here, about eight months we've been coming to Scottsdale Worship Center. Uh, we started coming because of our dear friends, Norbert and Tina Santlevin, who many of you know. And uh, we almost felt like we were part of this body before we ever got here, to be honest. So it's really been fantastic. And the people we have met, um, devoted to God, devoted to one another, this has just been, it's the best place to be. Just, that's my opinion. <laughs> just from a newcomer. Um, uh, we, a month or two ago, we started to serve in the ushering ministry to help Andrew and Tim, and so we're grateful for that opportunity. Uh, today, we're going to read from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 15. Uh, if you could stand, if you're physically able, in honor of God's word, and uh, Diana will read the scriptures. Good morning. Mark 1, 1 through 15, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all of the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him or when were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased." The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. You thank may be seated. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Tim. It's been rather beautiful. So, we are all very well aware that life can be a mixed bag. Yeah? And filled with all sorts of joys and great experiences and happenings. And then along the way, there is... These things called disappointments, right? These things we had unexpected in our plans and agendas. And if we're not careful, right, disappointments can lead to discouragement. And again, if we're not careful, that trough of discouragement that like sits like a big invitation says, come on, come on. Come on, let's wallow in this one for a little while. Anybody been there? Yeah. Leads us right up to the edge of having to make a decision. Am I going to give up? Question for us. How many among all the runners that failed and gave up on a race, how many crossed the finish line, roughly speaking? How many? Zero. Giving up is not an option in the Lord. Yeah. We'll talk about it a little bit. There's a difference between a decision to stop something that is not healthy, uh, that is destructive. But when we're talking about the Lord, it's very clear to us, don't give up. Yeah, but Chris, it's just so stinking hard. I love 
what uh, Tim and Diane, what you just gave some testimony of this morning. It's just a little sample of why the body of Christ is so important, not just for its, her existence, but for us to function together as a community of believers that genuinely are watching over each other, encouraging other, each other, strengthening each other, because here's the reality. Life is guaranteed to bring about disappointments. It just does. In fact, I think some of the, 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 the greatest harm has been done in the preaching, it's been failing throughout the, throughout the recent decades especially, has been whenever our preaching has failed to recognize that life is hard. To, all we do would be to gloss over and say, it's going to be okay and offer as many possible platitudes as we can because in reality, life is hard. There's a lot to life that is hard. Yeah. Some of you a little bit older than I am. Anybody relate? Everybody, the rest of us, yeah. We're learning. I love being around the young generation. They're so optimistic, you know, <laughs> right? So true, though. We need the optimism. We need the fret. Because here's what's going to happen with us. If we spend any amount of time in the Word of God, we're going to find it is an optimistic word for everyone who believes and places their faith in Jesus Christ. But that does not give us an escape from the realities of this world. So I just as we uh, step into this new series uh, this, this week, we're going to talk about the kingdom of God. Is that okay? Because, you know, Jesus loved to preach and talk about the kingdom. Why? Because that was his kingdom. So how many think we should be excited about talking about the kingdom of God, right? You know, so like Jesus was into it, you know, we should be into it. I say it again, there is a difference between giving up and stopping something that is harmful and destructive. And I, I purposely make mention of that here at the front end um, because the circumstances that you might be in right now um, may need the, the wise assessment of what's going on and having to discern what is it that the Spirit of the Lord is doing. We've, several of us are facing very difficult choices to make. And it could be tempted to just, again, just, just make this big, puffy, declarative statement, well, I just need to keep, keep doing what I've, what I've been doing. Um, the choice between stopping something and making a decision is, looks very different than a response that is based on despair and discouragement. Did you, did you catch that? Like, like so despair. I, I don't know about you, but I have were, made my worst decisions when I've responded in despair and discouragement. It just doesn't. It's so unhelpful. In fact, I've actually created messes. I've, I've, I was honestly, I was spending time pondering this morning as I um, just doing some personal examine, and I feel like the Holy Spirit reminded me of a, of a situation where I, I really responded out of a sense of defeat, and I, I created hurt in that person's life in that, in that situation. And, um, you know, I, I responded to the Lord with, with, God forgive me for missing that. Um, Half of you are sitting there thinking, was that me that he was talking about? They're like, yeah, he's ticked me off before. So maybe I'll just use that as a blanket statement. I failed you. I'm sorry. Can we move on? Yeah. <laughs> no, but in, in all reality, as it relates to our faith, we, we can't give up on relationships. We can't give up on each other. We, we, we absolutely cannot give up on God's promises. We can't give up on crucifying of the flesh, the things that don't belong in our lives, the things that are inconsistent with who God is. We can't give up. It's just never going to change. I've been struggling with this anger. I've been struggling this, with this addiction. It's just who I am. You need to hear the word of the Lord today. If you're in Christ, there is hope. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't grow weary. I, I, I say don't give up on yourselves. Um, because you're a child of God. And, 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 and one other category, there's many we could talk about. 
Dare we ever give up on the power of God? Dare we ever give up on the power of God? Possibilities are There is absolutely nothing that is impossible with him. And it's not just a little cliche, something to say. It's open up the chronicles of history, and you can know that God is all powerful. He is all sovereign. He's all able. And on us. Somebody say amen. And uh, I love this gospel, and we're going to spend the next several weeks uh, in the gospel of Mark. I, I encourage you, if you, if, if depending on where you are in your Bible reading, you may want to just take time with the, the gospel and just sit with it. Do if you can, it takes about um, uh, anywhere from an hour, hour and a half to, to go through the, the whole book in just one sitting. If you ever have that window, uh, it's, it's, that's an impacting time. But take time to reflect out of the gospel. It's a unique gospel. We'll talk more detail about it next week. Um, but uniquely with John Mark, uh, the, the author, he really was the the, the author of what we have is the first gospel. It would have been the, most, uh, the, the first of the four that we have. And he wants us to know something. He wants us to know. He wants his first hearers to know why we shouldn't give up. Because it's one thing to just say it, but tell me why. Somebody ask why. Why? Come on. Like it's the greatest kid question in the world, right? Like why? That's a good question. Why, daddy? Why? And the famous answer from all the parents is, I love it. I love it. I didn't like it when I was a kid, but I tell you, it works. It works, except for my boys. They just ask more questions. Um, John Mark, uh, full name there, certainly an artistic uh, writer. He artfully uh, describes the story of Jesus. Directly discipled uh, by the Apostle Peter. Just a little side information. So when we were reading Mark, we're, we're hearing a lot of Peter's influences. As Peter being a, uh, in immediate proximity or close proximity with Jesus. But uniquely with, with John Mark, he seeks to, to provide a, an accurate account, of course, of Jesus. Uh, but it was to those first century believers who at that time, especially in Rome, where they believe he, he was attending most to, was an early church that were dealing with incredible persecution, incredible amount of suffering. It was an early church that was gripped by the dark realities of living out their faith in planet Earth, on planet Earth, in a world that would be hostile to their faith. Can I ask you, do you think that might be a little bit relevant to us here in 2022, here in America especially? Uniquely with, uh, with Mark, we hear he is far more interested in giving his readers the message, the who of Jesus, rather than just the biographical facts and figures. In fact, some have asked, why don't we get to see more of Jesus' you know, like early life in the, in the Gospel of Mark? And I think a lot of it is just because Mark wanted to get right. Like, let's get to it. You need to know Jesus, because at the end of the day, he wanted to make sure that we knew why we can't give up, no matter the suffering, no matter the pain. He wanted us to know the personal Jesus, the God, fully God, fully man. Look at this first verse with me, just real quick. We'll just catch a couple things here, and then we'll get to why really ultimately I'm so, so excited about this series. The, verse, the first verse of, of chapter, uh, chapter 1, we, we heard it read. He opens this way uniquely. He says, the beginning of the gospel. And it's not the gospel of Mark. It's the gospel of who? Yeah. Everybody get that? Like, Paul, uh, Mark wants us to know this. Um, and it's gospel. It's good news, right? Um, good news. Interesting little, little part about the word gospel just to take note of, you know, we, we probably, most of us would know that it's good news. Um, but it was actually a common Greek word that many of, uh, many of, of, of uh, those in the secular society at that 
time would use that word associated to, to many things. Anytime they'd advertise a, a good, exciting, interesting happening, they'd use that word, good news. But it's interesting that this word, gospel, that we have translated for gospel, is one that now, it's almost like, um, it's almost like it's been adopted as, and held and brought together as like a, in, in, in terms of fully embodying who Jesus is. It's not just good news as in a bunch of information. It's this one reality. He, the person of Jesus Christ, is the good news. Like holistically, like, like there's not, because here's, here's the challenge, and you all know this, right? We can get so caught up with all the information that we miss the person. Has anybody experienced that? Like, like it is so, it can be a danger, and there's nothing wrong with great information. Lord, help us. And I, I, would, I would just reiterate, we, we, we need to be good students of Scripture. Yeah? Like, oh my goodness. Last thing we need is a, a, a bunch more heretics, right? Because we hear, this is what I feel good about. This is, this is my idea of a translation, you know? I'm just going to let my inspiration provide of a, of a new record. Here instead, the gospel says it's about Jesus. And it's not just... Jesus as a person, it's Jesus Christ. He wanted us to know it was the Messiah, the one who Israel had been longing for, looking towards, that one day the Messiah, the anointed one, the, the Prince of Peace, the, the one that would establish the reign and rule of God, he would be the one that would lead and usher in God's kingdom on earth. Mark wants him to know from the very get-go, this is going to be about Jesus the Messiah. You need to know this. He would be telling his first hearers. Wait a second. He's not just Jesus Christ, the gospel that fully embodies in Jesus Christ, but you've got to want to know that he's the son of God. Somebody say son of God. Like I want to know that he's not just a good person, but he's the son of God. And, 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 and he tethers it immediately to that which was promised, where God had said for hundreds of years it promised the coming of the Messiah. That which had been promised is here. And you need to know this. So here's the thing, just, just walk with the basic logics of this. These first hearers would, would read this letter. They would have already known about Jesus Christ, many of them. They would have known that Jesus Christ had died on the cross, which they struggled with. That has, oh, it was always the case among the, early, among the early church and the followers of Jesus. They really were excited about him being the king of kings. But it didn't make sense that he died. The Messiah doesn't die. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how Jesus, how, how like, we today, we can go back, and, and the same thing happened with, with Mark. He's like, Really? Because our very own scripture said it here and here and here. Well, we don't like that part of scripture. I am so glad that stopped happening 100 years ago, right? Anymore, where we just. Anyways, he announces. Um, the reason, if you want to just boil it all down, the reason we don't give up is because of one name, Jesus. It's the reason we don't give up. You say, well, that, Chris, that, you could have said that 10 minutes ago and we could have been going home. I don't know about you, but I need to hear it again and again and again and again. Still, the reality of why we don't give up no matter what is because of Jesus Christ and Him and Him alone. Amen? There is a reality that, that deserves the, the deeper ponderings, that, that, that challenges the status quo and provokes within us saying, God, what is it you're up to? Because I know you haven't given up on me. <laughs> now, now, there's some things I find myself at times wanting to hold on to. And God loves for me to give up those things that don't belong. Um, real quick, just catch what's... I, I want to make sure we catch this. If you've got your Bibles or your phone, right? 
You, you can just take a quick look here. at the, Just on this first chapter, how, how Mark, remember, he's just a, a man. He's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is writing these words. And he, under that inspiration, is, 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 follows a, 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 an important trajectory. I want to make sure these first hearers, I want to make sure they hear the story of Jesus. Like the real highlights here. Because they, they need to know the reason they don't give up. He, he, he starts following it this way. Verse 4, by the time we get to verse 4, we, we see the presentation of John the Baptist. He doesn't spend a whole lot of time talking about John the Baptist. Um, does make some important information about it. But really, what he mostly talks about is that John the Baptist would talk about Jesus. <laughs> He would talk about that, that this one that will come, that will follow me. You think, because you, John had a pretty good following, a, a pretty good sized church. Well, I, I'm, I must be the end. No, I'm just preparing the way. The real star, he's coming. He's coming. Get ready. Mark wants to make sure we get this. He says, I've been baptizing you with water. That's good. But he's going to baptize you. Help me out, y'all. Come on, this is interactive learning. Yeah, he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, right? So he wants everyone to know that Jesus is the reason. He's, and then he, he, he continues to write. Then he, he just highlighted, didn't put a whole lot of details. Verse 9, and he talked about the baptism of Jesus, that Jesus actually followed in the baptism. I just, I always like to make mention of it. If you have yet to be baptized in the waters of baptism, and you say, well, I don't know that that's really necessary. I just would remind you the simplicity. Jesus did it. Okay, so we follow Jesus. It's this outward declaration of, our, of a work that has happened. Jesus follows the same thing. But really, even that detail, the focus is more on the fact that with Jesus, when he was coming out of the waters, this description happens. That the Spirit, and, and capital S, the Spirit comes and presents. It's like a dove, the way, the way it was described. But uniquely, this is what's so important. A voice came from heaven saying this, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Would you mind repeating that after me? Say it with me. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Would you want to close your eyes and hear those words for just a second with me? Just let your ears hear it. One more time with me. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The audience, and Mark wants us to catch this, that the audience would have heard these words. An amazing validation, again, to the, very, the way Mark opens the writing. But this time, it's not just Mark writing about, or even the old script, scriptures of old that wrote about it, but God himself saying and putting on the confirmation, this is my beloved son. You're going to want to get to know him. You're not going to want to just know about him. You're going to want to know him. Because God just said, this is my beloved son. Man, I'm pleased. And it, you'll notice towards the end of, of, the, of the gospel, Mark will write the account of a Roman soldier who will be at the foot of the cross, an enemy of the Jewish people, an oppressor, will be like the climactic, almost Mark like makes it kind of the climactic moment when the soldier at the foot of the cross says, one, truly. He's looking at the cross with Jesus. Say, truly. He is the Son of God. All the way back here is John, the John in those waters of baptism, Father God saying, this is my son, the soldier. It took three and a half years for someone to finally get it. It's almost like Mark is suggesting that people struggle to the, with the reality of knowing and recognizing Jesus for who he is. We still deal this in 2022. We talk about Jesus. We are the most churched nation in the world. Used to be. Um, most people know about it. And yet we say, where's the revival? Where's the spiritual awakening? 
Because in the reality, there is nothing that is going to move that dial forward until we have a personal encounter with Jesus Christ Himself. 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 Amen. I just love what Mark does here. So beautiful. One more thing. Then, it, then it, that, that goes quick. And then verse 12, he says that the Spirit immediately, I love this description, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. For those that are still getting comfortable with understanding the work of the Holy Spirit, depending on how your traditions, and maybe you were raised. I've, I've talked to many, uh, well, my own, um, Jen's mom, mother-in-law, Susie, you've described so beautifully growing up in church and and yet never heard about the person of the Holy Spirit. Like, that's amazing. Yeah, as I was raised in Pentecost. Like, that's, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> so, but that, that's, the, that's the contrast. But here, Mark says, if you want to know about Jesus, you're going to want to know about the Holy Spirit. I mean, because what happened with the Holy Spirit? He actually drove him out into the wilderness. Mark wants us to see something. Jesus was driven, led by, inspired, followed the, the promptings of the Spirit. He was not following, he was not driven ever by Satan. Because we're going to find out here that the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. Even wild animals were there, but the angels are ministering to him. It's, it's an important detail because we're going to find out as we're going through this that there really is a Satan. There really are demons. And guess what? Jesus came to deal with Satan. And this becomes part of our hope. It becomes part of why it is we don't give up, even when we're under. You know, my brother Tim was, we were talking, man, I tell you, it was like everything to get to church today and uh, all sorts of troubles and challenges and like we all can relate those moments where it's like my goodness everything's working against me we can be reminded that it's the spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness to deal with Satan we're going to find out at the end of the book the end of the story that Jesus defeats Satan under his feet and and we're supposed to, we're invited to be followers of Jesus. All right. Anybody excited about reading the book of Mark now? I feel like I just, yeah, just a little promo. For, he says, uh, but then we get into verse 14 here. Let me just say one more thing. And I, I think that the, the transition here is interesting in verse 13. I, Mark wants us to catch this, this important thing that Jesus dealt with real life like he really had to deal with big challenges i mean the, the little detail here that he sticks in verse 13 uh with wild animals he dealt with satan and wild animals you know um it's why i've, I've titled this series thorns to throne um, Mark, knowing the troubles, the troubles that we deal with, the troubles that they were dealing with, the troubles that Jesus dealt with, that all of these troubles that in Jesus Christ point to a greater reality. Catch me on this. I said greater reality. Not that the troubles aren't reality. Not that those thorns the disappointments in life and the works of the enemy and all the challenges of the flesh, not that, they're, that we ignore the reality of thorns, but there is a greater reality that we are being pointed towards, and that is the throne, the very throne of God. Yeah, there's thorns, but the good news is, wrapped in the reality that there is a real kingdom that reigns and rules over all the other kingdoms, and it's the kingdom of God, where the reign and rule is from the one and only Jesus Christ Himself, King of Kings, who sits on the throne. Because the throne ultimately represents for us the kingdom of God. I, I think it's a little bit about, I, I don't know about you, some of you have been a Bible readers for a while. I think might find that Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 is one of your favorites, right? 
I, I just always do. I find such great uh, encouragement. I'll just read it with you real quick. Actually, if you don't mind reading it with me out loud, I, I appreciate it. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us so lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance race that is set before us. Help me out. Looking to Jesus, the founder, perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah, right? You know, like you want to, yeah, like, yeah, right hand. He wins. Okay, I was all excited by myself, but that's all right. I think that's a great finish. He's the, the writer of Hebrews, isn't he seated at the right hand of the throne of God? Like, like I, I want to read it like somebody, I, I don't know who that person is. What's Morgan Freeman? No, that's not. That's a different movie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Mark, uh, Mark wants us to see the reality of who Jesus is amidst the thorns. He looks, he, he makes this account. This is where we'll hunker down, and really for the next several weeks, this is everything that we'll see throughout the gospel will point to this, because this statement here in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, really become a, a summary statement of all of Jesus' ministry. He gathers around, like, like the, we, could, we rightly could imagine Jesus saying these exact words, of course, in his language, and... Um, we would hear the, the, he would be speaking these words, but we could also um, rightly assume that these words would be said in different ways and expressed throughout how he did the ministry and all of his activities. And these were the words of Jesus. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I want to offer these couple statements here that I, I, I really, these are, these are no, in no way original. I'm literally just presenting the word. But if we want to really ask the question with greater clarity, why is it that I would never give up my faith, the things that God has in and through me? You could always know and always be able to point to the simplicity of these words. Here's why. The first one is this. It's based on that phrase, the time is fulfilled. Here's why is because it's now. It's not a tomorrow reality. It is a now reality. Jesus is announcing as the Messiah, the time is fulfilled. It's now. Whatever you've been waiting for, all of what you've been waiting for, of the hope of the one coming that will settle it all, the time is fulfilled. I don't know how you feel about God's timing. Yeah? Yeah. Anybody ever tussled with God about his timing? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody still struggling to be okay with God's timing, right? You know, yeah. God, you know, you see it, right? God, where are you? You promised get to go back to this phrase because though God's timing may not be easy it's always perfect it's always perfect if you've lived and walked in your faith long enough and for our younger generation this is why it's so important to have and be around relationships with folks that are older in their faith and mature because they've walked it out they get to actually say you know what it really will all work out one way or another. And some of us could be in our 80s and 90s and recognize that there's still some things that have yet to be fully realized. 
but you would be able to stand firm and know at the end of the day, I know God's in charge. That He is the one who sits on the throne. And, uh, and I, just, I just sit with you in the space of recognizing that many of you are dealing with incredible amount of hurt, incredible amount of disappointment. Things did not turn out the way you had intended them to. And you sit here and you rightly would ask why. Why, God? What did I do to deserve this? And I sit with you in that space. But I would also love you enough to bring about the encouragement. Do not let yourself remain in the trough of that discouragement. It is one thing to be disappointed. But it is a slippery slope to fall into discouragement. I think one of the main causes of discouragement is misguided expectations with regard to God's timing. Do I need to say that one again? I think I want to catch this. That some of the main causes of discouragement is often by misguided expectations with regard to God's timing. I do not, you and I do not get to make determination of when and how God does something. But that is fully reconciled and balanced with the fact that God always has good for His people. Always has good. There is nothing that I can do, all my personal efforts to try and figure out God's timing. It may be a fun conversation, but you may find you're literally wasting your energy. Yeah, there are efforts, all sorts of efforts to try and figure out. And many of books have been sold in an effort to talk about God's timing, right? Here's what God's up to. And some of it is a clear indication, a revelation of what God's into. But so often it's just more of the same. God's always up to something, yeah? truth, the arrival of God's timing, Jesus arriving, would demand of those hearers a change of mind. What was, seemed to be disappointment, is now reality, and it's now, which would require some kind of taking action. It's like it's going to mean something, right? The, the, the time is fulfilled. Like, what are you waiting on? You, the wait is over. Like, there's kind of a stirring, a, a movement that seems to be happening there. Time is here. So I, I think part of the reason I, I would emphasize that this morning with, just, with us today, y'all, is, is there is a set time. Like, time matters. And we, 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 we need to use our time wisely. Like, um, I, I, was, I was thinking about, uh, Pastor Bob, remember this, back when we did a, a mission down in Mexico at Magdalena, we were or, ordaining uh, a whole bunch of, of pastors, and launching them into ministry, and there was an older pastor there that, uh, and they were all lined up, kind of like we're, for my dad is sitting, and they were all lined up, and um, Pastor Bob and uh, Dad, Pastor, Pastor Jim was speaking and ministering, and the guy sitting ab- about where you're sitting, Dad, no, it would have been next to you, because he passed, he, he dropped to the ground, dead, instantly. So yes, next to you, not, it's just not a good day today. I've got other things, so next to you. Um, he says, yeah, just drops and they tried to revive him. And right, Pastor Bob? I mean, this is the deal. He had no idea. They literally carried, carried him out. Fortunately, he was ordained first. And, and carried him out. Um, but the man was known to be so full of Jesus, so full of faith. Everybody knew. He just went to sleep straight into the arms of the Lord. We ended up ordaining his wife in that same meeting. Her being launched into ministry. At her church, and you're like, 
Well, what kind of timing is that? That's just really lame. I can tell you for sure that brother thought that timing was perfect. <laughs> right? You know, I mean, that doesn't make light of, of pain or loss that we deal with. But we can always know. Jesus announced the reality. The time is fulfilled. He was speaking of himself as the Messiah. It's now. But it was also the fact that it was near. The kingdom of God, he says, is at hand. Which is another way of just saying near. It's like if you have been waiting on, uh, well, Christine, Pastor Christine. So like you waiting on an Amazon package. Yeah? Right? But even better. Yeah? You know. I, I love the, the new little app on Amazon, right? You get to be able to follow the little truck going around to all the other places. And, and all of a sudden, he finally arrives, right? It's your, your door. But here's, here's what it was. He who had been promised has now showed up at the front door. Yeah, he's near. But what is near? Not what. Who is near? Jesus announcing the kingdom of God. Is at hand. Um, not just any kingdom. How many know there's lots of kingdoms in this world? Yeah. We'll talk more about those kingdoms throughout the series. But I, I would remind you of this. There is no kingdom. Please hear this. You must, must hear this. There is no kingdom above the kingdom of God. Absolutely no kingdom. And, and if we failed, if we, if we dare. Here, here's the problem with, with, with star Star Wars theology. Yeah, right. Good versus evil. Um, it's like it's put on the same plane. Evil up against good. God against Satan. If you've been thinking that, you, this, is, this message is going to be some really, really good news. Because this is the reality. God is the ultimate authority in every realm by which exists in this world. Every knee has to bow. Every demon, in fact, you're going to see throughout Mark, the first, the first ones to actually recognize Jesus is, is actually a demon. You know, I love that. I mean, how, or I don't love that. I'm not sure. But if we operate with any other consideration, we're going to find ourselves defeated. And dadgum, I'm like, I'll be first in the line. Say, if that's the case, I give up. But that's not the reality. It's the kingdom of God. And we have been invited to enter into the kingdom as one recognizing today that thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. The king has come. <laughs> and our joy and our excitement and our passion and how we perceive things is based on that exciting reality. Yeah. Thank you, Messiah. <laughs> You've come. And I think it's why it's not time to give up, y'all. Because the kingdom of God is now and it's near. Yes, disappointments will happen. But we guard against discouragement. Because ultimately, discouragement becomes a state of being. And ultimately... The kingdom of God is not just a place. It's a reality that becomes a state of being. So we have a choice. Am I going to live in the kingdom of discouragement or am I going to live in the state of being called the kingdom of God? The reality of who and where God is, that's where I want to be. Anybody else want to be there? Because I, I think this where we go. We, we too often settle with thorns. We settle with the dark realities. We call it, hey, y'all, we call it acceptance, don't we? Well, I just need to accept this reality. And there certainly is a place for acceptance. But if it brings discouragement to your faith, it has no place in the life of the believer, in the mind and heart of us. Amen? So how do we embrace this? So just there's this last statement here. The kingdom of God is now and near. We respond with the very words of Jesus, with repentance and believing. 
and it almost presents like a formula, and I guess in one sense it could be argued, but I, I don't think we want to look at it as a formula. I think we want to look at it as the human obligation to the divine blessing. Somebody get excited about the reality that the kingdom of God is near. Somebody. Amen? The kingdom of God is near. It is now. It provokes a response. Get out of all the other kingdoms. <laughs> Where there is sin, get out of it. If you're finding yourself attached to things that are distracting you or diluting your joy in the kingdom, get out of that kingdom. Turn it off. Turn it off. There's a greater, we call it, we, we know it as repentance. Repentance being a, a change of mind, a, such a radical a decision that says, I am not okay with this influence or this thought or this life. Being in this kingdom, I am out. I am out. I want that kingdom. I was talking, praying with the elders last night. And I was, we were uh, in our home and uh, we've got to, we're blessed with a really nice pool. And I don't know about you, if you have a pool, I like to tend to my pool to keep it clean, right? If you want to go out, you want to see a happy pool. I don't actually swim in it. We just look at it. All right. $90 a month pretty much just to look at it. But if I'm going to look at it, I'm going to make sure there's no leaves in it, right? So I'm always attending to it. And especially since the boys are not home, what happened to that? And, but we have a neighbor that has this beautiful, beautiful tree. And it is covered right now with those yellow flowers. And I promise you the only direction that that wind blows is from that house into my swimming pool. So I'm over there trying to fan it back. It will go the other way. So what do I do? I could stand around and complain about it. Complain to a neighbor. That's not going to help me show love. Or I can just deal with it. And I think that's part of what, because listen, the work of the enemy, the sin, the kingdom of this world is always going to work to be an influence to corrupt our life in the kingdom of God. So we're going to have to attend to it. And I remind you of what deception is all about. It keeps you from thinking that you have anything to deal with. It keeps you from seeing I've got areas, attitudes, thoughts, ways that are inconsistent with the love and life of Jesus Christ that I need to attend to. So get out the little, get out the little net and say repentance in Jesus' name because I'm going to believe not in something. I'm going to believe in the gospel, the very person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So it is in our weakness and our weariness. We don't lose heart. All right, y'all. I uh, love this quote. William, uh, Vice Admiral Stockdale. It's called the Stockdale Principle. I love this one. It's just a great leadership quote, but it really applies to this. Let me, let me just read it to you. As you may know, his story is a um, POW, an incredible, incredible life story. He, he writes this as one that had been for, for years in captivity. He says, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be. Folks, we call that repentance. Repentance. Paul writes it this way, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season. For in due season. Yeah, but I haven't seen it yet. In due season. We don't give up. And he gives us a challenge there. He said, what does that look like? He, but Paul applies this. Is the activity of the good works? It's like, yeah, but Chris, I'm so tired. And it just doesn't seem to, me loving my spouse that doesn't seem to be turning or responding or my trying to guide my kids, they don't seem to be responding or my finances don't seem to be responding. He says, don't give up. Not because it's just a big pep talk, but there's a higher reality, and this is the higher reality. 
If we don't give up on this now, near reality. We don't give up because thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Help me out on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. This is our reality that we get to not only know about it and, 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 and read a, a gospel like this and maybe even beautifully read some of the verses and, and maybe memorize them, but that we allow ourselves to be transformed by a new reality that says, this is exactly what I've been waiting for. And if you're here at the sound of my voice and you've never made a decision to follow Jesus and enter into the kingdom of God, today's the day. You need to know that. You say, well, I don't, maybe tomorrow. No, no, no. Now is the time. Now is the time. <laughs> And if we felt far from God, you found yourself in another kingdom, you say, well, wait a second, that just seems like I'm so far away. Here's what the beautiful reminder of this. No, the kingdom of God is near you. Always near you. Which is what the beautiful reminder of why it is that we don't have to work our way into pleasing God and to his acceptance. The invitation is already there. All the excuses have gone away because at the end of the day, there's really only one reason why we would never, ever give up. And it's because of Jesus Christ and Him and Him alone. The one who came and gave His life on the cross. The one who died for our sins so that we could forgiven is the very one by which when we feel all the discouragement we simply get to look and know that Jesus loves me that no matter what problems I'm dealing with I get to have hope in the reality of the kingdom of God because um Because it's now and it's near. Because it's now and it's near. Stand with me if you would. I say we live it, share it. One of the best things that we can do, get inside that kingdom God that we've been invited to and say, you know what? As far as me and my house, I'm going to live it. I'm like, I, I don't know, even know what all that's going to look like, but I'm going to open up the scriptures and I'm going to open up my heart to the Holy Spirit and recognize that he's going to move in me and I am going to step out of the kingdom of activities of this world and I'm going to enter into the kingdom of God like I've never done before and experience a renewed reality. Would you, in, would you take a moment in the posture of your heart and invite that right now? Begin to, begin to just in this space right now, begin to invite thy kingdom come on me, in me, with me, right now. Thy kingdom come on earth, right here, Chris, in Chris, this is what I've been praying all week. Thy kingdom come, God. Thy kingdom come. God, my, my, my vision, my ideas, the way I've been doing things, Lord, I want it to radically change to where it's all about you that it just looks like you, Jesus. Father, forgive me for any area of my life that has been inconsistent with the kingdom of God and your righteousness. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Can I invite you to a spirit of repentance for just a moment? In that, God, forgive us. Cleanse us. Oh, no more. No more. But I believe. <laughs> I believe. I believe in you, Jesus. You're my Lord. You're my Lord and King. Somebody begin to worship Jesus. Call on the name that is above every other name. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Church, would you bless the Lord, even right where you're at? Come on. Thy kingdom come.
to the Lord our God unto thee Lord Jesus be all the glory and all the honor and absolutely all the praise and all the church said amen amen bless y'all I want to just make mention like we do every week there's elders will be down at the front here around the crosses available I'd like to have somebody pray with you ready to make a decision follow Christ or some other needs we want to pray so Boy Scouts are going to be out there. SWC, you guys are just crazy generous. Thank you for that spirit. So this is a good way to just bless those kids, even if you can't go to the picnic, go to the, uh, the breakfast. Let's bless them with a bunch of tickets. So can I bless you today? May the spirit of the Lord God, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, dwells in you. May you be strengthened by the reality of the kingdom of God by which you have been invited into. May you be strengthened by his grace and his perfect love. To God be all the glory in his church. And all the church said, amen, amen. We love you, folks. God bless you. See you after service.